good morning, everyone. Um, and uh, thank you for uh, attending on a weekend here. Um, and that too, a weekend morning must be tough for everyone there. Um, but uh, it will be very worth the effort. Um, I really, uh, you know, we are having in our midst today a very distinguished, uh, um, I would say, leader, administrator, academician, someone who is uh, leading uh, the institute, uh, which grooms uh, administrators of this country, the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy um, of Administration in Missouri, uh, LBSNAA, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Chopra, and. Uh, he is uh, going to come here and enlighten us. And it's our rare privilege that uh, we are having such an authority among our midst. So um, I request uh, Professor Sashwat Vishwas to uh, you know, welcome him uh, before he starts his uh, address. So. Hi, good morning. And uh, it's with great pleasure that, sir, I welcome you on behalf of our chairman, Sri Dilipra, and on behalf of Birma. And uh, it's uh, my responsibility is to introduce him. And uh, we have already, uh, Sridhar has already pointed out that he is one of the most distinguished speakers, uh, where uh, he is. Uh, a career administrator, but when I looked at his uh, CV, he's more than a professor, much more than sir. <laughs> and and I I, I uh, no any, any career administrator would go through all the uh, levels of the government and all the become deputy secretary to secretary principal secretary. That's very normal. But what uh, I saw here is an academic. He has a great interest in history, and uh, he has earned laurels. For example, he was a Hubert Humphrey Fellow at Cornell, and a Robert McNamara Fellow at the World Bank. And uh, that actually took him to the inside workings of the <laughs> how international finance and uh, the politics of finance also uh, is involved. And he was a scholar at the Brookings Institution, he has also received the 21st Century Trust Fellowship and Australian Independence. And this morning when I was talking to him, and it emerged, he's an author. He, he has had one of a very, very interesting subject. So I will not reveal that. <laughs> he might, uh, during his uh, course of his lecture, um, I will not take that into it. <laughs> he will reveal it. And, and a very interesting subject that he's working on. And he has a plan, broad plan, of working further. And particularly as we have a common interest here, so history is a common interest. Though history is not my profession, it's a passion that I have for history. And I, I found that he shares the same one. And uh, now I request, without spending much time, our guest to share his valuable insights on the topic, the state and agriculture and it's to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Biswas, for a, for a lovely introduction. But as they say, when you describe someone as a scholar administrator, he's neither a scholar nor an administrator. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sritha. Thank you, Sanjay Benz, Sanjay and and of course, uh, the young uh, members of the Irma uh, batch who are here, Mr. Rath, who was my first ADM when I was assistant collector in Perulia, and we go back a long way. And uh, it is really remarkable that so many of us you know, are connected for this uh, session today. Okay, friends, what I propose to do is that I'll speak for about half an hour to 40 minutes, and then we'll try to open it up for a conversation. Uh, because I think uh, young people would be more interested in knowing about how one has come to the to some of the propositions that I'm, I'm going to propose before you. Now, the first thing that I want to share with you is that, you know, what is the state and what is the role of agriculture in the establishment of a state? Because 
You see, before a state can come into being, you need a permanent source of income. You need a permanent source of revenue. Because all said and done, uh, you cannot run a state unless you have a permanent source of income. And that is also the mark of distinction between a society and the state. Just move on, please. You can have the first slide. Mm -hmm. So settled agriculture marks the transition from a pastoral society to a territorial state. And that's a very fundamental distinction between a society which is pastoral because the surplus which a pastoral society produces moves with it. But the surplus which an agricultural society produces is retained or can be retained, you know, and there is there are there are systems by which we can retain the surplus which a settled agricultural society can have. And the second point is that a state needs to have the force to enforce its law. When I use the word army, I use the word army in the sense of army, police, paramilitary, and all the forces which enforce, which ensure that if the state wants something done, it can, it has the ability to enforce the law. Uh, you know, revenue collection is very tough. Nobody voluntarily wants to give up, uh, you know, their income. Uh, so whether it is a, whether it's a very large corporate firm or whether it's an individual, we all want to save taxes, and we do not voluntarily want to give. Uh, to, to the state. So there has to be a coercive machinery uh, to get the revenue. Uh, there has to be a priesthood, uh, priesthood uh, to give the legitimacy. There has to be textual authority to lend legitimacy because remember always that while power is always power, nobody wants to say that they are in power for the sake of being in power. They'll always say that you are in power because you want to promote socialism or you want to promote uh, a particular ideology you want to produce, you want to promote equality, you want to do rural development, you want to you want to serve the country. These are all the arguments that are given. Nobody, nobody, nobody says that I want to be in power because I want to be in power. People say that they want to be in power because they want to do something, right? So that is what gives legitimacy to power. And it's also important that power is not treated as an end in itself, but power is a means for doing things which, which uh, the political leadership, the social leadership at that point of time would want us to do. And last but not the least, it is the state which creates rights, duties and responsibilities which are legally enforceable. Look, in society there are some social norms, there are some things that we must do, uh, there are some expectations that we have for each other, but then there are certain sovereign expectations which a state uh, wants, which a state demands and which a state has the authority uh, to enforce. So that is very important. Expectations linked with the ability to enforce that particular thing is what creates or what distinguishes a state from others. And that is why these days you find that there are failed states. There are states which cannot enforce their law. There are states which do not enforce their law beyond certain territories. So those are lawless regions, right? So that is the conflict of the state. Next. Now I want to take you to the Shanti Parva of uh, of you know the, the dialogue at the when when Bhishma is on his deathbed and he and Yudhishthira are talking about in fact that is the first uh, real text on the state what is the state what should the state be uh, incidentally I mean all that Bhishma Pitama said he could not do in his own life but you know lectures are different from reality but that is actually what he wanted to project and so he's telling Yudhishthira that the king should take one sixth of the produce as the legitimate revenue from the from the tiller. And that is why Shatabhag or one sixth, I mean, the ruler is one who takes one sixth of the produce. That is the Hindu or the Indic concept of, of what, what is dharma. Dharma of the king is to protect his subjects and to take, in return, he gets one sixth of the produce. Uh, even in Kautilya Dharth Shastra, which is India's accepted political treatise, uh, one sixth of the produce is the legitimate share of the state. So the state has to run itself or the maintenance of the state has to take place from this produce which he collects, which the king collects. Remember also that in all the Harappan civilization, the first uh, you know, excavation, we find large granaries. Now granaries are, are areas where the produce is kept. So these are places where the food reserve is kept for war, natural calamities. And remember, those days traveling mendicants, you know, people would travel uh, pilgrimage or movement from, from one region to the other. And it was the duty of the king, the sovereign duty of the king to provide food to all those who were traversing this territory. Remember that India has always had this tradition of, you know, of, 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 of monks traveling across the country. 
I also noticed in my, during my visit to Mansaro that the king of Nepal uh, had kept small, uh, I mean, uh, there were small apartments and the foods, uh, I mean, rice and uh, wheat and salt were kept for traveling monks who would be undertaking the yatra to the monks over. So this is basically uh, just to give you an idea of how the, what all were the responsibilities of the state. Uh, of course, in those days, the big departments, like these days, we have the finance ministry and the this ministry and that ministry. Those days, uh, the important ministries were those, the heads of agriculture, horses, elephants. So these are all uh, people who had specific designations and they were responsible for ensuring that the state ran well. Now, just as in the Indic tradition, we had one sixth of the produce. In the Bible, you have references to the tithe, which is one tenth of the produce, which is the legitimate share of the state. And in fact, then you have the hadith, which prescribes the rates for Muslims. The rate for, for Muslims was one tenth of the produce. And it goes on to say that if you are collecting, if you are growing agriculture by the side of a river, it is one tenth. But if you're collecting water from a distance, then it is one fifth. And for the Jews who had been first uh, taken over, the Jewish land which had been taken over by the by the state, by the, by the Muslim state, it prescribed, uh, and then the Jews left agriculture because they felt that they're not getting adequate returns from agriculture. If everything is to be taken by the state, then what does the farmer do? So the Hadith said that 50% will be retained by those who occupy or till the land, and 50% will be the collection uh, for the for the state and for the Muslim Ummah at that point of time. So this shows what is the what is the authority uh, because these days, of course, the taxation proposals have to be passed by the legislatures. But those days, taxation proposals or, or the authority to tax uh, came from the canon or came from the from various sources. Let's move on. <clears throat> Therefore, one of the things that is very clear is that the farmers' right over land has been accepted by all traditions. All traditions except that the farmer must not be must not be unsettled from his land. There has to be some permanence of secure, uh, some permanence, uh, some permanent security to his land. Otherwise, the incentive, otherwise the incentive to till, the incentive to grow, the incentive to collect will not be there. Uh, and now I skip a few centuries. I mean, and I move on to uh, to the to the times of Akbar. When Totarmal, who was the one of the greatest revenue ministers of the Mughal Empire, uh, he and remember that that was a time when uh, I mean India had passed through a very turbulent phase during the time of the of the of the slave dynasty, the sultans, where they were not very sure on how long that dynasty would last, and therefore they would you know collect as much as they wanted to collect. But you know stable empires lay down certain norms because unstable empires. Or like an invading army, or or somebody who's not very sure of how long he'll be living, or how long he'll be ruling, will want to collect everything immediately. But people or or institutions which know that they are going to be there for a long time, they would like to set certain patterns, certain norms of taxation. And therefore, in the times of Parth Shastra, uh, sorry, in the times of Todarmal, uh, the although Abul Fazl continues to say that you know we'll be taking one sixth. But in actual practice, the average rate of collection in the times of the Mughal Empire, in the heyday of the Mughal Empire, uh, Akbar, we were taking one third of the farmers' produce towards the revenue. And this has many serious implications. First, what the first implication is that the surplus is moving from the rural to the urban, right? Because if one third is moving from the rural to the urban, this means that the urban is getting greater prominence. And that is what shows the growth of cities, because cities cannot grow unless produce can move or unless revenue can move from the rural to the urban, thereby aggravating food security issues in the rural areas. Second thing is that during regimes like those of Akbar, which are very, very large regimes, you see if you have a very small territory to manage or to, or to control, you can do with revenue in time. But if you have to manage an empire as large as that of India during the time of the Mughals, you needed revenue in cash. And when we need revenue in cash, it means that you move from granaries to intermediaries, right? And that is the growth of the RTS system. That is the growth of you know what we are seeing today, uh, 600 years later, is also the, the, the strength of the RTS system in, in the northern India. And that is being called to challenge because the intermediary 
would would make his money twice over. First, by converting that 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 kind into cash, and then enabling that cash to be transmitted to the royal treasury, and that royal treasury would then uh, provide incomes to all the mansabdars and all the zeladars and all the subedars, and that is how the state ran. But this transition from the granary to the intermediary, as the mode of transaction between the farmer and the state is a very important signifier of history, especially history when we look at it from the point of view of the farmers. You see, history, we can look at history in many ways. We can look at history, typically history has always been looked at in terms of kings and successions and the fights within the nobility. But there is a history beyond the history of the court. That is the history of the land. That's the history of what is being sown, how it is being sown, what is developed, and, and we move on. So then, let's move on to the next slide. And uh, <clears throat> then you see, after the Mughals, you get the East India Company in the country. Now, the East India Company really had no idea about what kind of land settlements were there. I mean, they took over the Diwani of uh, Bengal. The, I will not delve into that. But the remarkable difference which the East India Company brought in over what the Mughals were doing was that till the time of the East India Company, the farmers grew whatever they wanted to grow, and the state would only take a share of the produce. Money, the state found that its revenue had to come from whatever was being grown. But the East India Company also realized, because it was a mercantile regime, right? It was not just a, it was a regime which had, I mean, the, 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 the whole basis of the Mughal governance in this country, or oh, the, was, sorry, the, the way the East India Company came into this country was, it was a mercantile group. And therefore, as a mercantile group, they realized that while there is money to be made out of revenue, there is more money to be made in international trade. More money to be made in international trade than by collecting the produce from the land. And therefore, large tracts of land were covered by commercial crops for the first time in the country because <coughs> while <coughs> tobacco for self-use, some areca nut for, for self-use, some rubber for self-use, some coconut for self-use, that had already been there. But the Britishers brought in a system where they told the farmer that you shall grow indigo, you shall grow tobacco, you shall grow opium. And so what happened was a system whereby India was producing opium for China. Now, India did not have a tradition of you know, being opium eaters, neither was China a country of opium eaters. But the British commercial interest, it was the East India Company which forced India to grow opium and sell it in China, thereby creating an entire travesty of the way, you know, nature uh, had, had brought agriculture to do certain things. But the commerce of agriculture, the commerce of agriculture, therefore, begins to tell us that ultimately it is not what the farmer grows. It is now how efficient the farmer is in his field. It is the larger political ecosystem which determines whether the farmer is getting money or the farmer is not getting money. Whether the crops that we grow are merit crops or whether they are non-merit crops from these days, of course, it's easier to talk about these things. But remember that jute was being produced for Scotland. Coffee, tea was being produced for a much larger global uh, settlement. And along with that, you had this permanent settlement, Rayatwari and Mahalwari system. And remember that the first time famines happened in this country was when the East India Company took over because the connection of the farmer with the sovereign was not an intrinsic connection. You see, right till the time of the Mughals, uh, there was there was some philosophy, there was some there was some ideology which determined land relations. Right? I just mentioned to you that that even in the scenario, if you were to say that the uh, that the, you know not more than one, uh, not more than half could have ever been collected because that was what the Hadith said. But here, the East India Company did something which was very very rapacious, and that is where the agricultural economy and the rural economy in the country got the first dip, the first dive, and it has taken several years till the independence of this country to move ahead. But this is very important to understand the political economy of production and how production happens, how production is organized, because that is far more important. That is why, you know, that is why, uh, you know, that is why in Irma, we study not how to produce, but how to produce, I mean, the, the social organization of production therefore becomes very, very important. Next. Now, <clears throat> we come to the post-independence strategy of what we did after independence. Uh, this is all part of the political economy of agriculture. So first thing, remember that 
in in Gujarat itself and in, in Bihar, Champaran, and the Satyagras and the movements which were led by Rajendra Prasad and by Sadar Patel, they were trying, the Congress was then trying to understand that you cannot build a mass movement in this country. You know, look at the phases of the Congress. I mean, the Congress was a good debating society from 1885 till about 1905 to the first part of the uh, of, of the of the 20th century. But then it was realized that you know you cannot have mass participation in politics unless the land question comes to the fore, unless the agrarian question comes to the fore. And that is why you had the Champaran Satyagra. You actually had a documentation of what happens. You had plays written on it. The Neil Kuti. You had you know whole Neil Darpan. So you had a whole ecosystem of people looking at at the relations of farm with agriculture and the rapacious nature of the state because the state only wanted to extract the state did not want to give back remember that a colonial state has its own set of existence and an independent country has its own logic of existence an independent nation needs to talk to its people needs to communicate to its people and also needs to assure that they will always be well fed uh, at a later stage also well read and move on and on and on so what happened was that in the immediate in the immediate uh, context of independence, we had the land reform legislations in almost all parts of the country, in all part, all parts of the country, from you know from Uttar Pradesh to West Bengal to Punjab, and that meant that finally the farmers actually started getting. I mean, the culprit. I must make a distinction here between a landlord, a farmer, a cultivator, a tenant, and a farm worker. Now, everybody is generally bracketed as farmer, right? So you say farmer's agitation, this, that, that. No, it will be very clear. The agitation that's happening today in Delhi is the landlord agitation. It is not the agitation of cultivating farmers. Cultivating farmers will not have so much time to agitate. I mean, to be in a, in a, see, it's a, it's a movement of landlords. I mean, none of the people, see, who can own a tractor in this country? The small and marginal farmer cannot own a tractor. A tractor in this country. The economics of tractor holding is another aspect that you look at when you when you look at various things. But anyway, uh, to the subject that I'm talking about, the fact is that the first the first ten years were not any technological change in land reform. It was just the land going to the tiller. But land going to the tiller was the basis on which uh, the next set of green revolution could have taken place. In fact, green revolution could not have taken place under permanent settlement. Let me put it like. Green revolution could have taken place only, only when, when people owned their own land. And that is why green revolution was most successful in areas which had the Rayathwari system and the Mahalwari system, because that is where the farmers had greater control over their own entrepreneurship and their own enterprise. Right. So we set up agriculture universities. We looked at the agriculture department playing a very important role. Incidentally, agriculture had been a transferred subject. From 1935 onwards, and we had the Daaki system moving. Agricultural extension became important. You set up the Food Science Institute, uh, agricultural research. So that became uh, became a driving force because let's also remember that at the time of independence, I mean, 85 to 90 percent people were living in rural areas. 85 to 90 percent of them were dependent on agriculture in some way or the other, and therefore agriculture was the was the driving force. And that was also reflected in the pictures of those times. Though Bhiga mean you know, Mother India, you know, the films at a particular point of time also reflect uh, the change in society. I mean, a picture, a, a film, a movie, a successful a Bollywood movie or a Tollywood movie or whatever movie also reflects very seriously the ethos of that time. So, come that it be May, in, in the mid-60s, we had both the Green Revolution and the White Revolution. You know about that. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that the Green Revolution was driven by the state, and the white revolution was driven by the cooperatives. The red revolution was driven by the markets. The rainbow revolution or the horticulture revolution was markets in conjunction with state intervention. These distinctions are important, important to understand because some things are best done by the state. Some things are best done in the cooperative sector. Some things are best done by the markets. And some things are best done when you can collaborate and work. I do not imagine a situation where the Green Revolution could have been brought in by the cooperative sector. The cooperative sector only aided the Green Revolution. So you had IFCO and TRIPCO and farm cooperative societies and the primary agriculture cooperative societies. These were, but these were essentially driven by the state. 
I mean, the RBI wanted to push rural credit. So the cooperatives themselves would not have had the money to fund agriculture the way we were able to fund it under the RBI and then NABARD. So NABARD has played a very significant role in so the Green Revolution is concerned. Now, when it comes to White Revolution, as speaking from this forum, I need not talk to you about this at all. But the revolution for poultry, eggs, and meat, this has come from where? It's come from contract farming. It's come from integrated operations, right? So it's a different, it's driven essentially by the market. So if, if, if you have the cheapest poultry and the cheapest eggs in the country, uh, I mean, and at a global scale, that has not been because of any 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 state intervention. The state can, of course, give you some barrier, some loans for poultry and checks and things, but essentially it is driven by the market. And then when we looked at the horticulture revolution, this required both enterprise at the farm level and also very large systems to you know transport for logistics, for cold storage, because what do you do if you produce a lot of mangoes and a lot of apples and a lot of bananas if you don't have ripening chambers unless you have so so the entire ecosystem of agriculture has to be looked at when you see uh, how improvements and how changes will take place okay let's move on now you see there are two or three concepts which i want to share with you one is you see that till very recently that is till the 21st century Food security, income security, and livelihood security were not part of the political system. Today, because of the MG Nariga, because of the right to food, it is a right of every Indian to ask for food. It is his or her right to ask for employment. Now, this is a big change from about 20, 30 years ago when these were matters of grace. In the sense that if the employment guarantee scheme in Maharashtra as it was started, I mean, if the government gave employment, it was very good. It was a good political slogan that, all right, this party will give you 100 days work. This party will give you 150 days work. Or may give, may not give. It was not a mandate. For example, when C. Anandurai launched his uh, one rupee scheme, he had to abandon it because there was no fiscal, uh, I mean, he did not have the fiscal resources to implement it in the whole of Tamil Nadu. But today, no government, no government can walk out of the responsibility to feed everyone in this country and to provide at least 100 days of employment to everyone who wants it. And if your state cannot provide that employment, the state has to give the money for that. So it is a matter of right. So this has changed the entire rural ecosystem. Because today, agriculture is no longer the mainstay of either rural livelihood or rural incomes. So access to food, income, or employment in MGNR EGA or training for entrepreneurship under NRLM. Now, these are broadly similar objectives, but there are different implications because there's one implication if we give food to the farm to, to everybody in this country, another impl implication. So that is one of the things, you know, which, which uh, although the government has made it very clear time and again, as long as you have PDS in kind, as long as you have PDS in kind, we will need to have a CSEP, we will need to have an MSP, and we will need procurement. And therefore, FCI and NEFED and all the state agencies have to be in business. Because as long as there's right to food, and remember the right to food legislation does not talk about income tax. It talks about food. Food means actual edible food. Rice, wheat, you know, bajra, cereals, pulses also. Because now that we have 35 million tons of pulses, uh, pulses are also being added to the uh, to this to this thing. You know, you have now earlier it was only uh, 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 now, for instance, in several states, the Atta Dal scheme. So pulses have become a significant player in this. Whether or not these can work in conjunction is something that we can discuss at some point of time. Next. Now, another point which I want to share with you, especially when you look at the context of state and agriculture, is that. We have moved from an economy of scarcity to an economy of plenty. And when you move from an economy of scarcity to an economy of plenty, the laws and the ecosystem must change with time. What has happened, unfortunately, is that, that, you know, uh, that we have not been able to change the context. We have not been able to understand the context, and therefore we are repeating the text of the laws. Repeating, repeating, MSP, MSP, MSP. Now, MSP makes a lot of sense, but in our, in our transaction system, when you look at the entire span of agricultural economy in this country, what portion of that is in procurement? Very little. 
most of it, most of it is driven by the markets, most of it, and, and in fact, incidentally, I'm very happy that I'm sitting here in Anand. I mean, the highest value of an agriculture produces milk in this country. How much of milk is procured by the state? The state does not procure milk. The cooperatives produce milk. Uh, others uh, buy milk, and, and so whether it is, what has happened is that certain norms have been set. So whether it is Nestle procuring milk, or whether it is Amul procuring milk, or whether it is a private dairy, I mean, a non-organized dairy producing milk, certain norms and certain yardsticks have been set. And therefore, it is this that has to be understood. Secondly, we have to understand that except for, for, for very, very marginal farmers, the mode of production essentially is not peasant mode of production. It is from the peasant mode of production, we had gone to the state-led growth when the bulk of the cereals was being produced or procured by the by the by the state and now it is a market driven agriculture and so all these forms of agriculture require different sets of laws different sets of institutions and different sets of technologies right a peasant mode of production where you're producing essentially for yourself does not require too much of institutional intervention does not call for too much of technology when the state intervenes and is buying bulk commodities like wheat and rice there is a certain degree of technology that is required when it is a market driven agriculture where you are you know where, where you are producing grapes and converting those grapes into processed uh, foods or wines and you know make, looking at the global market or you look at the compact of grapes the maha grapes of maharashtra it is a market driven system so market driven system will have its own set of technology will have its own set of institutions and will have its own sets of policies third point is that cereals are no longer the driving force of agriculture no longer the driving force of agriculture. We have more cereals than we can handle. Uh, and therefore, the green, white, rainbow, blue, and red revolutions reflect the change. I did not touch upon fisheries because we have limited time. Uh, but again, fisheries is a sector which is driven by, by, uh, by, by deep uh, commercial pockets. And we need to actually make use of the past waters that we have around the Raven Sea, the Andaman, Nicobar Island, and the Lakshadweep. They have given us a very vast economic territory. We have just tapped, we haven't even tapped 1% of the blue revolution potential because the blue revolution potential will come about through FDI. It will not even, I mean, a very few uh, Indian firms also because a lot of uh, Indian firms have not really explored into the sector. But this is one sector which will call not just for Indian investment, it will call for FDI. And so we'll have to look if we actually want to make use of the resources in the exclusive economic zones that we have in Lakshadweep and Andamans, we'll have to look again very different. Uh, let's move on. Okay, so now I talk about one nation, one market, uh, especially in the context of you know what what I mean the the real resistance to change is because we are moving from an informal to a formal economy. So you are aware of all this. I mean, there's trades, there's KPMC, there's DNAP, and you know price assurance, dispute settlement. So let's move on. Uh, Let's move on because I think I need to give you time to, uh, to, to ask questions. Now, uh, this was in the context of farmers' agitation, and I think it's very important for people to come out and speak. Uh, uh, you know, because what happens is that most editorials will take you, they'll say, This is also right, and that is also right. You know, farmers should not have done this, government should not have done this. But I'm very clear that the three new laws which have come in are revolutionary laws which will change the face of rural economy, which will change the face of India. So, and, and this, of course, the difference between facts and factors. Let's cut this out also. Let's move on to the next one. Now, I had written an article recently on, on 10 facts about the, the farmer's agitation, and I want to give you my take on that. Fact number one, land holding pattern in Punjab, 20% farmers or 20% landlords hold 25, 95% of the area. SCs hold less than 5%. SCs in Punjab are 35% of Punjab's population. They are not involved in this landlord agitation because they're not landlords. Uh, the government of Punjab officially recognizes that about 20 to 30% of the work in the farmers' fields is done by migrant labor from Bihar and Bengal. The actual figure would be higher. Fact number two, that cereals are not the driving force for agriculture. The share of high-value agriculture, including dairy, is growing. Three, one. You see, the right to work, the right to food, and the right to education are three very, very important rights, which no political party, no political party has the gumption or the cuts or the political capacity to withdraw or even dilute. 
nobody can do it you see you may or may not spend on highways or airports but if you do not provide funds for mahatma gandhi rural national employment scheme to political parties sun and i say this with all respect whether it is the tmc or whether it is the bjp whether it is the congress or any party dmk no party has the guts today and this is a bipartisan agenda there has been no debate on this in fact if anything one of the things which all political parties have ignored is that when this when this right to food was 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 being done it was said that the issue price of food will be linked to the procurement price no political party also has the guts to increase that 2 rupees to 3 rupees because at the time when this law was made the procurement price was about 1100 1200 it has shot up to 2000 it will shoot up to 3000 but nobody will be able to change this 2 rupees 3 rupees rice scheme and there is no problem in that either a country of this size must must ensure that the poorest of the poor gets the access to food uh, the right to work and the right to food and therefore agriculture is changing and is changing very rapidly fact four i told you about agriculture workers in punjab or migration mechanization the agriculture growth uh, the agriculture growth in up mp is much higher more surpluses are coming from there fact five is that there is no threat to msp or csp procurement will continue as it is fact six is that dispute resolution is a very positive and a proactive step i mean if there was a dispute between say nestle india and the farmers you don't have to go to the courts you have to go to the local stm now there is a very strong advocates lobby which is getting into this i mean why should a dispute settlement not happen at the locust level at the level of the executive magistrate without lawyers right uh, procurement will continue enams will grow intermediaries will lose uh, and let me tell you that i'm sure many of you know that at least 30% of the land in this country is under informal contract already it is already under an informal contract with nobody 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 is going to give his land on lease officially the land rates in punjab are 25 to 30 lakh rupees an acre on which the resource that you are getting from an informal contract of 60 70000 rupees who will want to do it legally who will want to give away 25 lakh rupees of his real estate for 60000 rupees a year as an informal lease right so this is all legalizing what already exists and fact number 10 which i which which you all know is that corporates and this is something that you have to communicate that corporates are not interested in business not holdings ownership is no longer the driving value for a business it is farm mechanization value chains brand possibilities logistics these are the new growth drivers so this is how the political economy of agriculture is changing and now come to my last slide because there's very little time left so the infinite possibilities that i look at is produce in india feed the world you to reimagine urban agriculture technology information as the key driver of agriculture and here is the challenge will we take the lead will the cooperatives and fpos are we in a position to take the lead are we in a position to develop such nimble and flexible organizations which can work together with the corporates to give better value to the indian farmer to the indian consumer and to the indian corporate so that is you know we have always looked at you know one of the problems when you are uh, when you are a developing economy or a growing economy is that you are looking at things in terms of binaries that either i gain or the or the or, or, or the processor company gains either i gain or the cooperative gains i gain or the bank gains i gain or the now this is all got to change it's got to be me plus you it's not a zero sum game agriculture the way agriculture has to be organized has to be on a basis that you grow and i grow that your growth is not at my cost and my growth is not at your cost and it will also call for greater transparency in fact one of the thing that i'm looking at which i'm which which the corporates are not very comfortable with but i'm sure amul and the others would be interested in that why can't we price on every packet that what is the share that is going to the farm for example on a packet of milk we could then be in fact it is another transparency that has to come for that on a packet of milk which is selling 50 rupees i should be able to say that of this 50 rupees 28.85 paise has gone to the farm 2. Point some money has gone into the packaging of this so much money has gone into the processing of this so much money has gone into the transport cost of this this is the value that has been retained by the local cooperative society and this is the operating margin this will then impel people this will then impel others also to do the same 
why should then a potato packet of potato chips not clearly identify and say that of this packet of potato chips so much has gone to the farmers so much has gone to packaging so much has gone to this so much has gone to that and that will be a game changer the point which i keep telling the industry is that you ask the government for rti you ask the government where have you spent the money you want to know from the government how much has been spent on the travel costs of the minister how much has been spent on the travel costs of the director of the academy so you also let me know how much of i mean how much of money you spent on this and how much of money you spent on that so on this uh, uh, slightly interesting note let me end and uh, i'm open to questions it will be a pleasure to interact with you thank you very much first of all i would like to thank you sir for such an elaborate session it was a huge enrichment to our understanding with your due permission we have a few questions from the audience so the first question is that since agriculture is the livelihood of more than 58% of the indians and its economic contribution is reducing do you think agriculture cooperative formation should be the ideal solution to the economic sustainability of the sector see let's put it like this then one uh, the dependence on agriculture has to reduce you know the services sector the, uh, will will always be at the top end i'm followed by manpower this has been the conventional way in which history has has grown and i don't see an escape out of that what needs to happen is that all those who are engaged in agriculture must be adding more value to it now where do we add more value you see uh, I, i would put it like this that today in today's world there cannot be one stop solution for everything cooperatives are not the panacea for everything likewise the market is not the panacea for everything and the state is also not the panacea for everything there will be sectors there will be there will be commodities where the agriculture sector where the cooperatives will do very well like aggregation in the horticulture sector for example the fpos will do very well if you had a potato growers co fpos pro cooperative they'll do very well what is also very important is that you know this artificial binary that we created that cooperatives versus state cooperatives versus no i think the cooperatives in 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 bengal for example if you are producing potatoes for pepsico you will have to make a fpo you will have to make a cooperative which will then deal with the with the pepsi uh, with with pepsico likewise if you are dealing with with any commodity so you know uh, it depends on what is the kind of commodity that we are dealing with Uh, what is the geographical location that we are talking about because in very remote area for instance let us say the case of arunachal pradesh for example arunachal pradesh of mizoram which produces some of the finest pineapples i mean the pineapples of mizoram are, are delicious they are very nice they are very good i mean the uh, the the kiwis which are pretty produced in in arunachal are very good but those are places where the state will have to intervene because we will need to get trans we need to get them out so the economics will not work that is a much larger issue on the financial implication of the economic cost now we can either now look at it this way you can either subsidize uh, arunachal through the budgetary support or you can support the farmers of arunachal by extracting the produce and you know finding a so these are all things which which will you know if you who you have to ask a very specific question and only then i'll be able to give you a specific answer because uh, and it's going to be very different you know kiwis from arunachal is a different cup of tea from grapes in uh, in in, in nashik right so in nashik it's a collected area there are a lot of farmers they grow grapes bombay is nearby they can sell the wine and they can export the wine but what happens to arunachal so uh, you know and, and, and let me tell you that once this 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 road from agartala to uh, dhaka once that starts you know the economy of uh, of, uh, of of the whole northeast will change so economic possibilities are not just a function of what you are doing it's a function of what is happening that the rural roads program for instance i mean the pradhan mantri gramin sadak yojana has brought about a lot of change i mean once there is internet connectivity uh, throughout the country and and if there is more uh, ideal literacy happening you will find that things will change you know so it's a it's a question of how you how you i mean uh, each commodity is very specific so that's uh, i'm not skirting your answer but it's difficult to answer let's put it like Right, so thank you, sir. Uh, this one more question. Uh, it says there have been a lot of policies for agriculture and allied activities, and sometimes beneficiaries remain unaware of them. So, do you think that at the policy level, an integrated flagship program or a policy should be implemented? Certainly, you see what is you have to look at it. You know that we are dealing when we talk about communication, when we talk about you know farmers should know. Peasants, you know, we have 125 million land holdings in this country. Uh, 
That was about three, four years ago. Now I think it should be about 130 million uh, farmers speaking about 20 different languages and speaking about 40 different dialects. So it is a big challenge. It is a big challenge. And that is why this challenge will have to be responded to by the state and also by the market and also by many other uh, organizations. A lot of So this has to be done. It's not an easy task. The point is that are we better than we were 10 years ago? Are we better than we were 15 years ago? So in that, you know, we have to look at things incrementally. Today, because of the because of the SMS and because of WhatsApp groups and things, today no farmer in the country, I and mean, every farmer in the country knows what the rough market prices are. So even in the remotest part of the country, people will know uh, what is the price where. So now the question is beyond information. Now the question is that that is there a transport facility available? Is there aggregation happening? So those are the next set of challenges before us because again information is not an end in itself i mean what do what do i do i mean i'm i'm a farmer sitting in uh, say i'm a coconut producer in many koi islands i know that this is the rate of copra what do i do with it i mean unless nefet comes in and procures what do i do you know what do i do if i have produced it so it, getting information getting price information is one aspect but uh, being able to you know organize your logistics being able to aggregate the produce being able to link it to the market uh, ensure that uh, there are no uh, disruptions on the way. That is the real challenge. Uh, sir, just one more question. Uh, that which has been the most impactful and historic agriculture reform in your opinion? In my opinion, the most historic is what happened here. Uh, the, the Amul experiment is, has been one of the most successful interventions ever, uh, anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world. And I say it with all humility, and I say it with a matter of great pride. So it is both with a matter of great pride and a matter of great humility that I say that this is the place. This is the place which has actually transformed a new possibility. You see, one thing is that what you have been able to achieve. That is one. The other is that what is your expectation? What is the possibility you've been able to dream? And I think this is what Amul has shown, that by collecting one liter, two liters, three liters of milk, by giving a very clear um, idea to the producer that, look, this is your fat, this is your center. And 30, 40, 50 years ago, they were able to do it with little centrifuges and with that, with that you know, what is it called? Um, centrifuge. Uh, yeah, uh, so we've forgotten the names of those machines uh, also. But, you know, so what was the logic? In fact, you know, the currently the academy and Irma uh, and the CDC, we are doing a study precisely on these, on, on these things, that if we can actually pay the farmer on the basis of the quality of his produce, he or she will be incentivized to produce better quality produce. The problem with FCI and NIFET has been that it is just checking fair average quality. So fair average quality is whether you fail or you pass. And let me also tell you, all of your Irma students, if it's only fail or pass, you will work only as much as as you are required to pass. You are not going to move towards excellence. Move towards excellence is only when you know that if you've done well, you get an A plus, you get an A or you get an A minus. If it is only pass or fail, then everybody's performance. Everybody's performance is just about to pass. So that is something which, and, and unless you give price incentives, unless the farmer is being, uh, being paid more for producing better quality rice and better quality, and today we have the technology for it. You see, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, remember, as I said one thing very clearly, that there's a difference between economies of shortages and in some other context I was reading, you see that, you know, during, during war times or other times when, when the country needs um, officers and they need soldiers for the army, standards are relaxed. Standards are relaxed. So during the emergency commission, you have an emergency commission officer, right? So, I mean, then you're not looking at, you're not looking at, are you good? You're only looking at, are you not bad? So we now have to make that transition from uh, from not just being good, but to being excellent. And that is where, uh, and now that, you know, you have a whole set of markets, you have a market for very good milk, market for cow milk, matter of this. So that is what will have to happen in the case of FCI also. It will have to happen in the case of Nippet also. Right? Hello? Yes, please. Yeah, hello. 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 Yeah, may I ask a question? I'm Shailendra Apirma. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Dr. Chopra, uh, thanks for uh, giving this uh, 
perspective on this agricultural history of uh, India and where we stand and also reflecting on the issue of the current uh, bills. Of course, uh, you, you made a point uh, that uh, this, uh, this agitation that is currently going on is uh, one of the landlords. You gave statistics of uh, Punjab. Huh? Yeah, Punjab has a different kind of a land holding pattern, but there is also considerable tenancy. But the agitation has been going on in all other states also. And uh, small farmers in India constitute 86% of the holdings, right? And uh, it, they, it, therefore, uh, for various reasons, it is being portrayed as if it is only a Punjab based. Of course, MSP is important for Punjab and Haryana. So they are also worried about that because these laws possibly, if not today, but in the coming days, uh, might uh, weaken or uh, might dismantle MSP, if not immediately. Yeah? So therefore, they have that fear also. But there are uh, agitations of farmers against these bills all over India and uh, who are largely from the small holding classes. So therefore, uh, the perspective that you said that it is a landlord-based kind of thing. In India, of course, if you still consider that the landlords exist in a large number, that is a wrong understanding. Uh, India and the economy is moving towards marginalization and uh, peasantry has become a major uh, kind of a thing. And in a few years from down line, many of them will also will join proletariat classes. Right. So therefore, uh, uh, somehow I differ with that uh, argument of yours that it is a landlord based uh, agitation, which is a wrong understanding of Indian scenario possibly and wrong understanding of the movement. Yeah, I believe you're all entitled to our views on the subject. But let me just give, give some facts in perspective. It's important. You see, we are talking about an India where the right to food and the right to work were not cardinal. Today, the son of a marginal farmer is no longer interested in doing agriculture. He wants to move out. And why not? Why should agriculture and, and small agriculture be made a holy cow? Already in Punjab and Haryana, the consolidation of land has started taking place. It's empirical. So, you know, what? who is driving agriculture in this country? Who will be the people who will drive agriculture in this country? We cannot dispute the fact that there is largely great degree of informal tenancy that is happening which means that the smaller farmers are giving their lands to bigger farmers because agriculture is no longer viable in that space. You see, you don't have two cows. I mean, you don't have two oxen and a plow any longer. You don't have it. All harvesting is being done through combined harvesters. There's agriculture mechanization that is happening. And all this is being aided because of MDNRE. What I want to bring to the table, sir, is that with 80,000 crores of, of, of money going into MGNREGA, and with uh, similar amount of subsidy, more than 100,000 crores going into PDS, the entire economy is changing. So earlier, when a person who was on the farm or the person who was in the agricultural sector had no option, he was being compelled to be in the agricultural sector. Today, he has an option to move out. So if he or she has an option to move, look, as, as citizens of this country, as we, the, our primary responsibility is to ensure that there is livelihood and there is food security. That livelihood and food security has to be tied up with agriculture and with peasant mode of agriculture is not a proposition which I'm willing to accept, but you are entitled to your views, sir, and uh, let everybody debate on this, so it's fine. I, mean, I can only say that this is my viewpoint, and your viewpoint also would have many takers. Thank you, sir. I have a question. Thank you. First of all, my comments, your wonderful uh, presentation. And uh, for the first time, as person, my personal opinion, first the first time you know, I'm reading newspaper articles, this thing from people, but uh, a very clear, uh, you know, um, what we call is a, a, a very clear description of what is happening, and uh, maybe some glimpses of the laws that are coming, that are coming. Uh, my concern that from because in EPA we are all uh, you know soaked in cooperative movement and there are certain pointers in the cooperative movement and we have a concern. The concern is this: if individual farms are allowed to directly interact with uh, the multinationals, the big agri uh, processors, uh, without any organization of their own or any other intermediaries like government that acted as intermediaries. Long time, what will happen to those relations? Because it's an unequal relation, relationship of unequal power. 
so what is what is your take on this? How do you think that this can be done? You see, uh, who is managing these large corporates? They're all being managed by Irma graduates. Or by <laughs> or by you see, we, which there is no Lalaji who's managing a company today. I mean, look, look at it this way. I'm telling yesterday's example when Gujarat uh, Mbuja, when Gujarat Export, they are, they are into, into the business of maize. They're looking at Irma graduates. They, they, because it, is, it has to be professional. And as I said, I have already made a point that let us bring in transparency in this aspect. Let us make a let's make a beginning here. So if that is done, then everybody will know. I mean, today or tomorrow, people are questioning these things. Right? And also, let's understand that we are growing. India is no longer a poor country. Please, let's let's get this out of our heads. India is a country which has a lot of poor people, but we are not a poor poor economy any longer. There are systems, there are processes. Let's so look. When ITC procures or anybody procures, there's a grain, there is a sort X machine, there's a grain machine, and everybody knows these economics, right? <coughs> so if Ashirwan had increase, increasingly, where, in fact, let, let's also, where does the bulk of the money from the Ashirwa data pack go into? Does it go into, into, into beef or does it go into marketing? Does it go into packaging? Where does it go to? So as we will evolve, we will understand these things. So I, I, I mean, you know, we are so scared of change. And we are so scared, and, and let's also understand the fact that even today, is FCI allowed to procure in Punjab? It is not the FCA which is procuring in Punjab. It is the Ardhiya who is procuring in Punjab. So that is uh, the other aspect. And look, the fact is that as the economy will grow, there will be consolidation of land holdings. I can have a coffee bet with you and with all the participants <laughs> here that in the next 10 years, there will be consolidation of land holdings because this, this model of, uh, of, of, of uh, you know, very, very small marginal land holdings playing a role in the economic life will not happen, especially because the right to food and the right to work are not matters of grace. They are matters of right. You have a right to expect. You have a right, and laws are very clear. In some state, it is the BDO. The Supreme Court has made it very clear. So many states and have worked in the state government. It is now very clear that it is your job. You have to provide what are we looking at? Are we looking at, at, at subsistence agriculture? Are we looking at, I mean, I, I, am, I am with you, Professor, that everybody in this country has a right to food and everyone in this country has a right to work. And if those two rights are determined, then we must move into the most progressive and the most, uh, most competitive agriculture uh, so that we can feed ourselves and we can feed the world. And that's the way to go. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjeev Chopra, sir, for enlightening this session on such a topical issue. The lecture was an insightful journey on the development and growth of Indian agriculture, exposing us to the various economic ground realities and how managerial and administrative perspectives evolve over the time with them. Uh, on the behalf of our chairman, Sri Dilip Pratsa, faculty, staff, and the students of the IRMA's three programs, I thank you for sharing your views with us today. Thank you, sir. We are really grateful. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure interacting with all of you. And my compliments to, to Dr. Rath and of course to Sir. One yes. Thank you, sir.